Reminding you what Chris Jones, our regular correspondent out of the UK, says in terms of Ireland playing us in a quarterfinal. The Test Series you know, back uh, in New Zealand for Ireland will be a fantastic reference point. You know, that, what, is it there for, what is there for them to fear? It's going to be the All Blacks who will be thinking, crikey, how do we actually stop this Irish team which can come at us in two or three different ways? All right, Steve Hansen joins us. Then welcome back to the show, mate. I was... Listening and reading your comments about any Jones and New Zealand, uh, sorry, Australian rugby and the crisis that they're in the other day, day before last. Haven't we got enough issues on our side of the Tasman here to worry about without worrying about them? Well, I think there's a few issues going on in Southern Hemisphere rugby that we need to sort. And I know the rugby union are uh, working hard at trying to do that. So it's hopefully we see some progress in that area. And, uh, you know, but everyone has to work together. I was, the one comment I thought was really fascinating was you're talking about, you know, they don't have the strength to have five teams, and we've got to be realistic about this, because Super Rugby, Ken Laban made a comment a couple of weeks ago, he said, we, we're, we're swimming in the shallow end at the moment, the competition's not hard enough, and I wondered if you centralise the Australian teams to back to three teams or something, that'll be more competitive, that seems like an obvious idea. Yeah, well, th- minimum of four anyway, so... Um sorry, maximum of four, I think, would be uh, make it better. And that's when Australia rugby was really strong. Like, they had three sides that were competitive every weekend in Super Rugby. Uh, it was forcing us to to have to, um, you know, get better ourselves. You know, we are missing having South Africa in, in that there, that style of game, and um, maybe bringing back the Argentinians and... Finding a way to get them back into the competition will be good too. Do you think that Super Rugby can be a competition that is that is good enough to prepare our guys to play test matches against the likes of South Africa and Ireland, the very best teams? Well, it has been in the past, so there's no reason why it can't be a, again in the future. But, you know, I think we'd all agree that at the moment... Uh, it's not the competition we need it to be. And we have to find a willingness to work together uh, within the country and across the countries to come up with some uh, solutions. When I, and, you know, that's been the, the, the stumbling block so far. When I hear the likes of yourself speak about this and you speak so calmly about it and you speak with such authority and experience about it, I always wonder, why can't we get these brains around a table together yourself and who else that needs to be there and just work our way through this it seems to me to be a lot simpler than the way than the the, the, the complex matter we tend to make it all the time yeah well the, look there's a, one or two things that get in the way one is our ego of well, I don't I don't want to give up a team look we saw Australia try to do that in the Western Force you know dug their toes in and they had nowhere to go so at some point, that's what I'm saying, with internally at some point we have to say to ourselves, righto, well, this is what's going to be best for our game. And, you know, one of the, when you're hearing um, the likes of Hollis, you know, the, the ex-Wallaby player coming out and saying the same thing, then you know that it, it, it's the obvious thing to do, but we have to break down the barriers that are stopping us from doing that. And, and within... Australian sport, the, probably the biggest barrier is state v state, like that no one wants to give an inch. And if we're not prepared to give an inch, then we're going to lose a mile at the top end and get, you know, look, I'm not saying Eddie and the players aren't it, there's no fault of theirs in, in this World Cup. You know, they'll reflect on it and say, yes, we could have done some things better. But Australian rugby has a problem because it's not producing players or coaches that can play and coach at that level. Um, not enough of them to create competition. So they have to do something different and, and they have to be prepared to challenge themselves around that, as do we. We have to look at, now that we don't have South Africa playing, how do we how do we find that competition? What are we doing with our under-21s and, and you know, how do we get them more games and, and start making that team more important? Because... One of the things the Northern Hemisphere have done have they've done really well in developing their under-21 players, and they're winning world uh, cups and and so forth. They play at Six Nations, 
like they're mirroring what they're doing at a, at a higher level. So that's giving young guys a whole lot of experience. Our guys aren't getting that, and and uh, I know that you know New Zealand rugby is looking at certain things they want to do, and but we just need to, I guess, get on with it and and get things happening. But all this costs money, and that's another big stumbling block. So Australia don't have any, and and uh, we don't have uh, an awesome amount of it either. But you know we've got to prioritise what's really really going to help us get to to that level that we need to be at to, to be number one. World champion. All Blacks coach Steve Hansen on the programme with us on the platform. Between 2019 and this World Cup, looking at what you saw and were part of in Japan compared to what you're watching now, how has rugby changed? How have the best teams changed? Well, the, the, one of the things that have changed is that uh, the game's slower. You know, ironically, we've been trying to put all these things in place to make the game more ball and play time. Well, we're not getting more ball and play time. It wasn't until we saw a referee who wanted the game to be played like it should be in the Iron, Irish South African Test match. Agree totally. Oh, he didn't. He didn't. Uh, he didn't go to the TMO every five seconds. He actually took control of the game, and that's what we want from our refs. Um, we have to give them confidence to be able to do that. And, and um, we, we, he didn't allow players just to say, oh, look, I, I need a breather or I need to do my boots up or I need to have my tummy padded. <laughs> you know, he said, no, we're playing on. Yes. And, and that forced the game to have a, a, a decent flow about it, which, you know, the biggest complaint the, the spectators and fans have is the game is getting hard to watch. Now, we can't afford that. Um, there was no yellow cards or red cards, which was great. You know, like the red cards, I would I would uh, be quite confident in saying that since they've been introducing all these red cards, we haven't we haven't prevented one head head knock. And that's that's the whole point of it. Like we're trying to get better at making sure we don't get people injured. Well, the red cards aren't stopping that. All they're doing is highlighting more and more of them, and uh, most of them are unintentional. So, you know, it's, a, it's an old song we keep singing, but yep. we need to, to be looking at different ways of actually educating our players how to tackle, change a few laws up, um, and then, you know, personally, the TMO, way too much involvement in the game for me. It gets to the point where, okay, the only thing you can adjudicate on is... is uh, is tries. Is it a try or no try? And and all the foul play stuff, uh, if it's seen, goes on report. If it's not seen and it's happened, then the judicial system, uh, you know, comes to play and bang. You know, like if it's a if it's a real intentional punching someone or kicking someone or you know, a real deliberate act, then yeah, okay. Well, we've always had a red card for those things, so that doesn't change. We've got to make the game something that fans want to get excited about and watch. And, uh, you know, how, can't rely on people being rugby nuts forever. How, how, how much does... It used to be a nutritional sport where by the end of 50 or 60 minutes, you've run that forward pack off their feet and that's where the ball comes into play, more, more gaps arise. These days with an eight bench, it's almost like you bring on another offensive team like an NFL, and it takes away what I thought is always a crucial element. It's a test match, you get worn out, but being able to bring on seven forwards completely counters that. What are your thoughts? Oh, look, I, I think good on them if they want to take the risk. Like One of these days they're going to lose a couple of backs and they're going to be in trouble, but they're prepared to take that risk. You can still wear them out if, as long as you're not stopping every two seconds. For like, ball and play time in the French All Black Test match was 27 minutes. The ball and play, I think, in the, it was either the Melbourne Test or the Dunedin Test, at half time was 27 minutes. So you know, it, the game's got to be faster than that. And uh, no one's going to get worn out if they're allowed to stop every f few seconds. Right. Or the average time for a TMO interjection is one minute and 38 seconds. 
Wow. Or thereabouts. You know, that's the average. So there's another break where you get a break. They're stopping every 20 minutes when it's hot now to get a drink of water. They get enough breaks as it is. They don't need to manufacture another one. Mm. And, all, and, and in the meantime, all the fans are sitting there, you know, oh, well, I may as well go make another cup of tea. How do we, the All Blacks, if we play Ireland in the quarterfinal, that looks really likely, after watching Ireland, South Africa, and just the sheer physical nature of those two forward packs, which I thought was a fantastic test match, thoroughly absorbing. How do we how do we beat a team like that? Because our forwards don't look at the moment, I mean, this is just my view of it, that they don't look as though that physically we can compete in that kind of headlock contest for 80 minutes. How do we break those teams down? You know, well, we can compete. That, that, what, you're, what you're saying, is, I don't agree with. Okay. We can compete. But what we've got to look at and say, in, in the last few tests, we haven't, and, and then ask ourselves why. Well, four weeks, seven players hadn't played for four weeks before we played South Africa, so they're always going to run out of petrol, especially when they went seven and seven themselves. You know, they had a big shift in their forward pack. And um, and then again against France, OK, well, they played two games in, in six weeks. So it's, still, it's not enough rugby, but they took that choice because they want to build into this tournament and they're going to get plenty of rugby. So how, how are South Africa and, and the likes of those teams that have had lots of games and tough pulls going to be travelling at the back end of the tournament? You know, are they going to start feeling it? Um, that's the first thing. But, look, I think if we want to beat uh, Ireland, we have to be able to take them on up front, um, contest that line at time, make our scrum really potent and, and challenge them there. Um, breakdown, I think we need to go through the breakdown. They're not putting anybody in the breakdown themselves. So go through it rather than um, trying to play wide. And then once we start going through it and we narrow them up a bit, then we can go wide. Uh, we have to we have to get to Sexton. Like he, he's a phenomenal player, uh, probably the best I've ever seen at making the right decisions on the line, who to give the ball to. I don't think I've seen a player anywhere in the world or any time in the world as good as he is at offloading the ball to the right person um, at the right time. Under pressure too, I might add. So we've got to get to him um, and that means uh, anyone around him we have to tackle so the South Africans did that showed us what to do there like they just tackled everybody around the ball because he could give it to any one of them and that put them under a wee bit of pressure so uh, they're tough so we have to um, make sure that we're prepared to stay in the fight stay in the fight stay in the fight take the points when they're on offer and, and keep ticking the scoreboard over and try and put them under pressure from a scoreboard point of view if we can put scoreboard pressure on them, it's like, oh, here we go again. We're not going to get past the quarterfinal. So that'll that'll put a bit of pressure and maybe distract them away from where they need to be mentally. But uh, they're, they're a good side, uh, both them and South Africa, are very good sides. But so are we. I think you know the, the four top teams are all capable of winning it. Um, France have had a bit of a knockback with Dupont being injured. But uh, if you have a good day you have a bit of luck and there's no yellow or red card uh you're in the fight and um it's just going to be a shame to see two good sides get put out in the quarterfinals when you know the draw could have been done as it is in the world soccer game you know six months out and and you know these, these would have been the semi-finals we could win this from here still yeah why not like um, we played South Africa, we've beaten them. We were the last team, I think, in the world to beat Ireland. And I think we're playing a lot better now than we were when we did that. So, uh, yeah, we can beat them, what not.